Today we're talking about mistakes and myths with optics. But there are also a ton of myths that can make you spend way too much money on a scope that won't even fit your needs. So today I partnered up with some absolute experts in different areas of long range shooting, accuracy, and optics to talk about some of the myths that they hear from hunters and shooters like us. I'm sitting here with Ward Bryan. Basically, when military snipers from SEALs to National Guard to even hunters uh, are looking for training, this is where they go. You don't like the Christmas tree style reticles. No. Uh, a lot of people see that as, oh, you know, if you're a really advanced shooter, that's what you're going to want. So basically what it says is if I, you know, shoot and I need to hold a little bit high and maybe to the side for wind, now I have lots of little data down there in that, in that Christmas tree that I can hold over three and up two and whatever not. Um, but you seem to have two problems with those Christmas tree reticles. What's the, what's the number one reason that somebody shouldn't use one of those? It will cause you to miss high when you're shooting flat and when you go to shoot on angle because of the angle of incident sunlight as it, as it hits the uh, uh, aggressive angle of the lens, the light gets bent downwards and away from the light source. It, it causes you to miss, to miss severely high. And when you come outside of one third of the optical center of the viewing portion of the lens, you, in, you, you number one, defeat the purpose of the design of the rifle scope and the assembly of the lens system. And you also come into the curvature of the lens, which causes you to look at a distorted and displaced image. Yeah, you can see that even on an iPhone. If you shoot the really ultra wide and you look at the edges, somebody's face is on the edge, it's all di distorted, right? But then on a, and they try to correct that as much as possible on a scope to make it rectilinear, but it's never going to be perfect, no lens is. And so what you'd rather see people do is dial for elevation and just hold the windage so we don't need to get crazy down there. Right, because your windage will be off, plus your vertical will be off, and you're defeating the purpose of the build of the scope. So the, the most accurate method of utilizing a scope is the method is that it was designed to function in, and that's to utilize your turrets, your elevation, your windage turrets. Well, if people are looking for training, they can check out the Mountain Shooting Center and get in touch with you. Ooh. I'm sitting here with Kevin from Element Optics. Uh, I'm sure as an optics manufacturer, you guys hear all kinds of myths. Yeah, we've heard a lot. <laughs> so when people are looking at scopes, you know, in the display case, and there are so many options, one thing that I hear pretty often is you want to get the bigger tube size, not the bigger objective bell, you know, sure. the bigger, the front end of the scope, the, the business yep. end of the scope. That one, okay, but a lot of people are talking about the tube size yep. and they want it as thick as possible to allow more light to get through. Is that true? No. Why not? Seems, um, seems right. Yeah, it sounds logical. And you know, the, the crazy part is, is the, the number of people that believe that and then like the jobs that they have, I'm talking about a lot of SF dudes that, I, that I'm friends with. I mean, it's a general, probably one of the biggest misconceptions with optics is tube size matters as far as visual clarity, amount of light that you're getting through. So and why are some bigger than others smaller? It's very simple. It's for travel. It's for elevation and amount windage of, travel. Amount of yep. spin on the turret. It's going to give you more elevation, more travel, but it's also going to give you more glass and more glass is going to be where you're going to get more weight. Heavier. Yes. So uh, if you want more light, you get a bigger objective lens. That's the only way. That's all, that's literally until somebody comes out with some new spooky something. That's it. That's the only way you're getting more light into that scope is a larger objective lens to gather that light. And there are all kinds of coatings that can assist oh. maintaining that, but bringing it in. Yep, absolutely. That bell. Absolutely. And then so there's one inch tube size, thirty millimeter and 34 millimeter pretty yep. much you might say a 35 or something weird sure. but it's pretty much those who should buy a one inch who should buy a 30 and who should buy a 34. Uh, so one inch is going to be typically your your older scopes there's not many that are made so much in one inch. super light more. hunting yeah scope. they're going to be super light duplex type reticles and the reason they're one inch they're not dialing on them yeah all right so they're, they're just Caps using turrets. yeah they're going to cap the turrets after they get everything optically zeroed and then what they're going to do is they're just going to basically have their target within a, a known distance. When people go and buy a rifle, and then it doubly hurts when they gotta buy a scope, they go and look at the rings mm -hmm. at the store, and you see some rings for 20 bucks, and some for 150 bucks, and they look the same. Why in the world would somebody spend a lot of money on expensive rings? 
I'd is say it worth it? I'd say it is. Uh, the repeatability is uh, definitely one of the key things with this. So when you take the rifle apart for cleaning or whatever, uh, when you put the rifle back on uh, or rifle to back together and the scope back on, torque it up, it's normally on the same spot. So same zero. And you know, bouncing around in a truck for a week, you want to make sure that that thing isn't going to get knocked off at yep. all. Going from a hot to a cold environment, yep. different metals, you want to make sure that it's going to stay tight as much as possible. Yep. Plus, we all know you can take a very fine, expensive scope and turn it into a piece of trash, cheap scope, yes. if it's not mounted right. Yeah, you, you can destroy the internals with, uh, you especially see that on the, on the parallax. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you go zoom, you, you can kind of get sticky points. Ah. That's a big red flag. Yes, having a torque wrench, yeah. <laughs> you must own a torque wrench yep. if you own a rifle uh, so that you can get the right uh, connection on those rings. So the real issue with the rings is, First of all, how concentric they're going to be, those things, so that they have even pressure everywhere on them. Plus just a lot of design things. I've bought some cheap scope rings before. Take it out on the first hunt and the screws are rusting and yep. stuff. Uh, or I notice like, uh, you know, the, the scope is moving and different, different things. You just see fewer problems with them. Now, I don't think you always have to go buy the most expensive rings every time but get quality rings that you know are made by a company that can do it right. Yep, yeah, the big manufacturers, they, they have good reputations for a reason. That it's just so weird. Everybody who's serious about long range shooting tends to go to mill. Mm -hmm. And yet, the MOA is a finer adjustment. It is, a click of MOA is less than a click of a mill. It is a finer adjustment. You gotta understand, people don't wanna deviate from what they're comfortable with also. And that's the biggest issue with MOA is people are comfortable with the numbers, they understand it. So they don't want to try mills to begin with, where if they tried and went to the metric system and tried the mills, they'd understand how easier it is to correlate to long distance shooting. I, for a long time, I held pretty tight to MOA. I felt like I'm a hunter. Everybody that I know shoots MOA. Mm -hmm. And then you get into more and more serious shooting uh, areas. And for whatever reason, I don't know that it, one is really superior than the other. There are benefits and drawbacks like we've talked about. Absolutely. But for whatever reason, when you gravitate into really serious longer range shooting, everybody's shooting mills. They are, and, and this is the other issue with it. Okay, if you shoot, if you spend all your time with hunters who shoot MOA, you've got to be able to talk MOA to them. Yeah. Okay, so when you get into the long distance shooting world and you're dealing people with people that are shooting in mills, You've got to be able to understand and communicate in the same language, basically, so you're understanding the same issues. Next myth is you got to spend big money on scopes if you want that really good result. I learned this with you guys. Um, so you have uh, Element Optics. You have expensive optics yep. that are very, very capable. Yes, they are. But we've done two long range shooting courses together yeah. and I was using a $700, yeah. three to 18 by 50 Titan. Yep. And I mean, the tracking has been perfect dry at, you know, very extended distances to a mile that we've been shooting. Um, and I think like, dang, that's 700 bucks. <laughs> like what, what do you need to spend the more expensive on? so your friends like you more i guess <laughs> uh, it's going to come down a lot to a lot of times guys they associate cost with quality and it's not necessarily the case today uh, element makes an extremely amazing optic and i'm going to throw the caveat out there for the money i don't think there's anything better and that's just based on how we build the optic we're not building it to hit a certain price point we're literally just focused on the end shooter and trying to get the best possible optic to them and we cut out a lot of the bs that you don't really need um, so where you're going to spend a lot more money is going to be uh, different optical companies that like, uh, you know, the, the Japanese glass and then your German and European glass and things like that. Guys, there's some really great glass that comes out of the Philippines. A lot of, you know, I hate to use the C word. A lot of good glass comes out of China. A lot of it has to do with not necessarily the region of the world that's made in, but the tolerances that it's made to. And, and that's a very big thing. And uh, when you look at, you know, do you need to spend $3,000? You can spend three thousand dollars on a scope that just does not work for what you want it to do yeah and that's what i would say is it's i don't think either of us would say there's no purpose in spending two grand on a scope no, there's some absolutely sweet there scopes out there and they do very nice specific things but what i would <laughs> say is don't spend two grand on a scope unless you know exactly why you need that one yes. and why a 700 hundred dollar scope isn't going to hack it so because for for your hunter, yes. for your even decently serious longer range shooter, 
you can do a lot with a pretty inexpensive scope. You can, and I like to just use a very simple Pepsi challenge, if you will. Take the most expensive scope you think you would ever buy. I mean, I'm talking about like the two to $5,000 optics, and then take something like a $700 element. Look through both of them and then be able to tell the person behind the counter exactly why you're spending three to five times the cost. And on if the you other know, scope. then there's good nothing wrong you. with that. Good yeah. on you. If you know, then you, then that, then, then you know, okay. And that's, but if you don't know, don't spend the money because you don't have to. So many people, I'm telling you right now, if you want to spend extra money, spend money on training. Uh, Cause that's going to make, be able to make you make the most out of that scope. And I would tell anybody any day before you go blow $3,000 on a scope, go spend $700 on that optic from element and then take the remainder of that budget and come out here, see Ward and learn how to actually use it. So basically two different types of scopes. There's the capped turrets that, you know, you have to spin the cap off and then you can zero it with that. And then an exposed turret scope where you're in dialing the, the whole turret there. Mm -hmm. um, and the purpose of it is if I want to adjust from, you know, that deer's at 300 yards rather than saying, I'm going to hold on his back. I'm going to dial up to whatever 2.4 MOA. And, and then my reticle is perfect on the spot, right? So people look at two scopes with exposed turrets and they say, well, they probably track exactly the same, right? Each click is 0.25 MOA or a, a tenth of a mil. They're that's, all the same, right? That's what you're supposed to, uh, they're, they're supposed to do that. But normally see, you see that on, on lower end scopes or, or the most affordable scopes, they don't track that well. So the only way to expose this is actually to, to um, put a rifle stationary put up a, like a scale uh, from uh, 1 to 10 MOA or 1 to 10 mils at 100 meters and the, or 100 yards and start tracking. Right, and so you want to make sure that your reticle lines up exactly where it should yep. as you go up. Correct. It can be a tough test to do perfectly. We got to make sure we're exactly 100 yards, that we are you know, exactly vertical on that line, everything, but that would be a, a way to know it. Yep. If you have a scope that doesn't track very well, when you're out at distance, you could be missing low or high, and it's not your fault, it's your scope isn't tracking that distance perfectly. Yep. Similarly, when you're sighting in, I've had a few scopes that were just bafflingly frustrating because you dial, it's like, okay, I'm three, I'm about three tenths right, I dial three tenths, and I move like way too far to yeah. the left or yeah. something, yeah. you can see sometimes a scope that isn't doing well. One of the things you can do to actually counter that is to, if you go, say you do five mils of elevation, so we go to 5.2, so we go over and then back down. Because normally it's a, it's a spring issue, so you see it doesn't, it doesn't follow like it should, but if you go past and then back down, same thing with uh, elevation or with windage. If you go like two minutes or two mils to the side, go over and then back. Could be something to try if you're having trouble. Yes, sir. So those are your optics myths. Thanks everybody for joining me on Backfire and be sure to check out Backfire Plus where we have courses on shooting and hunting and reloading and much more.